we turn our attention to Farmer Giles of Ham. And I think probably as was the case also with Leaf by Niggle and with the essay on fairy stories, um, those of you who are Tolkien fans who have not yet encountered this but really know The Lord of the Rings and or The Hobbit, Silmarillion and so on, probably didn't see this one coming either, <laughs> as a matter of fact. But what it tells us, among other things, is that Tolkien has an extraordinary variety of gifts, more than he's frequently given credit for, by those who sort of read and dismiss fantasy works like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, or those who find the Silmarillion too dismal even to contemplate. But we know now from uh, Farmer Giles of Ham that Tolkien has a profound gift for, well, burlesque. Right? I mean, there's a certain kind of humor here that is broad and ironic and multi-referential. And the characters, I should think, would remind us more than any other characters in the rest of his work of the hobbits themselves who are treated in similar burlesque fashion when the story is exclusively about hobbits. And notice too, please, that as is the case with the larger major works, Lord of the Rings in particular, Tolkien is at great pains for reasons we will have to discuss and continue discussing, to legitimize his own creativity. You may remember in the essay on fairy stories, one of his remarks about fantasy itself is not only that it sort of transcends this Coleridgean process of suspending disbelief, it goes beyond that, it creates secondary belief. That's a major concern to him, that what he's doing engender secondary belief. And so he also mentions in that context that creative works that participate in the machinery of magic, exercise dominion and power rather than enchantment. And in turn then, he brings us to a concept of creativity that he says is shared, almost communal, beneficial to those who encounter it, and not conducive to the dominating power of the artist. He says elsewhere that the reason he dislikes allegory is also that it seems to participate in machinery of domination. That is, it feels as if he is being taken under the control of an author who wishes to dominate him. And he doesn't like that, and he doesn't like creativity that manifests itself in that way. All that being said, he then nevertheless, or perhaps consequently, puts himself in the position of having to justify what he does. It's as if fiction is nevertheless always somehow suspect. And part of his burlesque in Farmer Giles of Ham is the process of engaging in that justification. If you would look with me, please, first of all at the foreword. Who pays attention to forewords? Yeah, <laughs> right? It's a good idea, as a matter of fact, if you can find the time. And I would certainly recommend it. Ah, catastrophe, not you catastrophe, right? Mm. As he, <laughs> indeed, yeah, it's every afternoon. What he's most concerned about here then, even though part of this is done as it were tongue in cheek, it's actually a reflex of the burlesque itself, is to provide a kind of context that seems to make this story true. While at the same time, because it's burlesque, undercutting its authenticity. So, who reads forwards? Not many people, a few of you do. And the first word you will take note of in the first line of the foreword is history. Of the history of the little kingdom, few fragments have survived. 
I want to I want to understand this. Of the history of the little kingdom, few fragments have survived. What does that immediately invite you to do, Michael? It kind of invokes this sense of filling in the gaps. Yes, right. Very importantly, this is to be understood as the air, a narrative which is heir to the fragments of a history which is true. This is a history which is true. At no point, of course, is he going to self-consciously say, and oh, by the way, it's really just fiction. I'm making up this history in order to provide a background for a narrative I don't really believe in. No, he's saying it's true. An account of its origin has been preserved, a legend perhaps rather than an account, for it is evidently a late compilation full of marvels derived not from sober annals, but from the popular lays to which its author frequently refers. What does he do with the story of Farmer Giles of Ham? He first and foremost tells us that it can only be distantly verified by the surviving fragments of history that it has grown in the telling since then on account of popular songs carried about the countryside in times long past, but after the end of the Little Kingdom. So already we're at two removes. Then he goes on to tell us, perhaps not all con altogether consistently, because after all, popular lays would be in the common tongue wouldn't they? Which in this world would be, well, at least maybe English, maybe Welsh, or some other Britannic Celtic tongue. Then he goes on to say in the second paragraph that it's a translation. It's a translation from insular Latin. So someone has taken popular lays about a kingdom for which we have only fragmentary evidence, compiled them into a single consistent prose narrative, and translated it from Britannic Celtic to Latin. So now we're at three removes. Are you reading it in what he calls very insular Latin? No, Leah, what are you reading it in, please? It's in modern English. So he has translated it. How many removes is that? <laughs> now we're at four removes, right? So what has he done in a very curious kind of way in order to give the story a sort of parodistic time depth? He has also removed it from presumed original sources and identified it more clearly than he could have if he put a label on it as fiction. It's make-believe. So he has simultaneously challenged your credulity, the credibility of the narrative, he has challenged your credulity, and he has also attempted to satisfy it. So if we invoke or provoke credulity and attempt to satisfy it, do you perhaps see where we are in relation to fairy stories. Where? Where are we in relation to fairy stories? We're in that, anybody? Michael? James? We're pretty strongly in a fairy story. How so? Um, because that's what fairy stories do. Right. They provoke it and then satisfy it, or at least attempt to satisfy it. So what we have is a, what I'd be moved to say Tolkien intends to be construed as, a parodistic representation of fairy story. Is that consistent with the agenda that he seems to lay out in the essay on fairy stories? Is there room in fairy for this particular kind of burlesque? Go ahead, please. Since it doesn't mock the idea of magic. That's right. It can be applied. Right. What it doesn't do is call into question its own internal rules. 
it does not impose domination by mechanical magic, and additionally, though Tolkien does not talk at length about this in Fairy Story, because I'm not sure he altogether approved of it, nevertheless he engages in it, it also, in the opening of the narrative itself, invokes a past which is in many regards superior to the present in which we are reading it. What do you suppose was ultimately the appeal of the kind of fantasy that Tolkien himself wrote? What was the nature of the particular kind of escape that he seems to have been practicing and inviting us into? Would it not be, in point of fact, a characterization of an other world, always with capital O, right? A characterization of an other world, which is not only different from this one, but in many respects constitutes an escape from this one. An escape from what specifically? Well, Farmer Giles of Ham points in the direction he means. He says, for example, not altogether seriously, right? We always have to have that proviso with Farmer Giles. He says, for example, in about the fifth line, people in those days, in those days were richly endowed with names, suggesting that we are poorly endowed with names, often having only two or three. Farmer Giles's full name is Egidius Hinobarbus Julius Agricola de Hama. Right, a mouthful. How do you do? I am. Egidius <laughs> Hinobarbus, etc. But he says that's a rich endowment. He says this island, by which he means Great Britain, was still happily divided into many kingdoms. Now, does he mean that in the old sense, by hap, by chance? You know, the vagaries of history and politics? Or does he mean joyously divided into many kingdoms? I prefer to choose the latter, joyously divided into many kingdoms, especially since he makes a kind of darksome reference to the modern tongue of the United Kingdom, as if somehow to translate it from insular Latin to the modern tongue is a bit of a reduction. So the United Kingdom, in contrast to a past in which the island was happily divided into many small kingdoms, is a bit of a letdown. So the past, I hate to say it this boldly, but he's frequently been accused of this, and there is a tiny grain of authenticity in the charge. The past is better than the present. Why would he choose to set the tale in this particular time frame? Which, by the way, exactly is what? It's clearly the past. It's clearly at some point when the island of Great Britain was happily divided into many kingdoms. <laughs> but when was that, James? We're told it's between King Cole and King That's right. Arthur. That's right. Which is too fictional. <laughs> That's also <laughs> correct. Yeah, King Cole is fictional as far as we're able to tell, at least legendary, as is King Arthur. Both perhaps grounded in dimly glimpsed historical figures on whom they are modeled. But that period would put it at the end of Roman Britain, say early 400s, and the middle 400s. So do I understand that people, just to jump ahead a moment, that people in the early 400s AD in Britain had firearms? No, you say no. You're all sure about that. You're right. Firearms are introduced in the 15th and 16th centuries. They help in some measure, thank you very much, they help in some measure to put an end to what we think of as the Middle Ages, right? Knights in armor going up against Gatling guns <laughs> or something of that sort simply don't work. You can shoot right through their armor. So it's the 400s AD, but Giles has a blunderbuss. 
A blunderbuss, which by the way, page 131, has to be defined. Now, I say blunderbuss to you. I mean, you know, you're Americans. You're raised with guns. You know exactly what they are. <laughs> no mystery to you at all. Most of you probably have guns, as far as I would be able to guess statistically. <laughs> and that's fine, I don't care. So you know what a blunderbuss is, but he has to define it for his audience. But he takes the occasion of defining it to have some real fun, at least for insiders. Right? So this is page 131, and most of you should have the same pagination. He says at the top of 131, some may well ask what a blunderbuss was. Indeed, this very question, it is said, was put to the four wise clerks of Oxenford. Now I'm going to pause here for just a second to explain something, all right? Oxenford, Oxford, is an Anglo-Saxon era name. As is the name of the village where he lives, Ham. It simply means village, or more broadly, home territory or home, right? Anglo-Saxon term. The Anglo-Saxons come in the middle 400s. So if this is an Anglo-Saxon region, it is only very recently Anglo-Saxonized, and in fact, it's not likely to have been. So not only is this context rendered momentarily as Anglo-Saxon, it also is revealed as a deliberate anachronism, like the blunderbuss itself. He also makes believe that the four wise clerks of Oxenford existed at the time of the narrative. And they replied, a blunderbuss is a short gun with a large bore firing many balls or slugs and capable of doing execution with a limited range without exact aim, now superseded in civilized countries by other firearms. He puts that in quotation marks. Do you know why? Yes? As a matter of fact, yes, go ahead. No, same thing, right, right? It is, in fact, a direct quotation from the Oxford English Dictionary which was compiled at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Tolkien himself worked on it. He was a clerk <laughs> for the compilation staff, all right? So he's one of the four wise clerks of Oxenford, if you want to put it that way. And it's a direct quote. Look it up, right? I mean, we have a subscription in our intranet over at the library. We have a subscription to the ongoing developments of the Oxford English. And there it is, the very first definition of blunderbuss followed by a definition of somewhat later provenance of blunderbuss as a person who is basically a loudmouth. It just shoots off his mouth. It's a blunderbuss, right? So where are we? Firearms are introduced in the 15th century. The Oxford English Dictionary is compiled at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And we understand that the tale is saturated, therefore, with anachronisms that themselves then are deployed as exercises in insider knowledge and minor witticisms and ironic asides, yes? Why is all this machinery necessary? Why would he do this? Cat, what do you think? Why would he do this? You know, in most of the stuff that we know so well, in The Lord of the Rings, for example, Matters are rendered, with the exception of the hobbits, in the Shire, right? Matters are rendered with such epic grandeur and tragic profundity that it's difficult even to recognize the author of this story as J.R.R. Tolkien, especially if the hobbit passages were not so similar, right? What is all of this disjunctive material doing here? <laughs> Yes, right? This is part of the, the shifting border between fairy and the so-called real world, right? So as this border shifts, it blurs our sense of time. It gives us an opportunity, therefore, to fulfill one of those primordial desires in an amusing way, rather than what we might think of as a tragic or epic way, yeah? And that is to survey 
the depths of time and space. Right? He's also having other kinds of fun, which I hope we'll have a chance to talk out, uh, about. They're related. But let's get on with the narrative itself, shall we? Okay. Given the setting, which is very early medieval or pre-medieval, with anachronisms, we have a pre-modern, non-technological society. Or rather, we would have to say accurately, its technology is pre-modern. So, what's missing? What kinds of technology that Tolkien himself generally detested are not here? I mentioned one the other day, anybody recall? It's in the essay on fairy stories, as a matter of fact. Yes, he detested, for the most part, seems to have detested automobiles, right? The noise and stench, to say nothing of the wastefulness, of an internal combustion engine. So, cars are missing, automobiles are missing. Farmer Giles seems to be the only person with a gun. Yeah, how that happens, right, that's all for fun. So modern technology is gone. Remember he talks about the ugliness of mass-produced street lighting in the essay. There's no mass-produced street lighting in this story. So part of its charm, paradoxically, is that we can enter that other world, have a bit of a lark in it for a while, and come back to the real world in some sense, changed. When I first read on fairy stories back in about 1967, I was struck by that passage on internal combustion engines. I've never looked at cars the same way since. So it changes you, right? It's meant to change you. It's not meant to turn you into a Luddite necessarily, an anti-technological fanatic, or some poor deranged dope-headed hippie tree hugger. Right? That's not necessarily its purposes, among its purposes. But rather, it's to take us out of the moment we are in, provide us with the space in which these fantastical things can happen for our delight and perhaps for our improvement, and then to let us come back in some sense consoled, changed, perhaps improved, if art has that power, and he seems to believe it does and thereby refreshed. What is specifically refreshing about Farmer Giles of Ham, either as a character in himself or as a story in its entirety? What do you think? Yeah, what's refreshing about the story? You read it, you escape for a while, you come back and you think, that was enjoyable. <laughs> yes, yes. So the characterization of Giles himself is a very strong component in this narrative. And if we think for a moment back to Leaf by Niggle, yes? Think of the characterization of Niggle and Parrish. Go ahead. I thought they were very similar because uh, Father Giles, he was always, or the farmer, he was very like, oh, I have to do my land. That's oh, right. Oh, I have That's to right. do yeah. my land. You can always find and something like else. Niggle, how he was yes. Like, Oh, I, I want to do my painting, but he was very reluctant to help people. It seemed very much like that. Exactly. And how he kept trying to force so, yes. the sword back in. Exactly. Yeah. So this is a character who, like Nigel and like Parrish in their respective ways, are reluctant in the face of what appear to be their fated tasks. Right? Now, we'll talk about fate and intentionality in the design of the universe as we go forward, but there's a hint of it certainly in this tale, and there is, of course, an explicit component of it in Leaf by Nigel. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, like towards the end where he actually knew when to stop and not get... That's killed, right, yes. Uh, the dragon, like, yes. Bring out all of this treasure, I just yes. thought that was smart, because usually in other stories... Uh, Hero yes. Way too yeah. And, wants it and there'd be an end to the hero, <laughs> right? As he himself remarks, you're absolutely right. And of course, what you're pointing to in terms of the characterization, likewise, is a very rich feature because Farmer Giles starts out being described one way, and he ends up being characterized very differently. What happens to him? He's a reluctant hero. We're told that he's kind of slow and rather set in the... Does he remind you of anybody? If you're, if, you're, if you're fans of Hobbits and Lord of the Rings already, does he remind you of anybody? Bilbo? 
Bilbo, right? Bilbo who would rather sit home in his garden on a beautiful morning blowing smoke rings and watching butterflies than go off on a nasty, uncomfortable adventure. So for Farmer Giles is really very much of that kin. That's partly why these elements of the story would remind us so much of Hobbit's broadly conceived. So he begins one way and like Bilbo, goes through a sequence of adventures and is different by the end of the story. Dare we say improved, right? He has become not just heroic, which indeed it must be said to his credit, he is, he has stood his ground and made use of the luck that has come his way. But as you suggest, my friend, he's also gotten smart, yeah? He has become the kind of person we would want a ruler or an executive to be, right? And so he will also be wise, it would seem to me. So he goes from being like Niggle, really only concerned about his own affairs, not interested in other people, kind of sharp and harsh with others, as a matter of fact, dismissive of them. And through the process, he becomes, do I dare say, what he was meant to be. Just as Niggle very clearly becomes what he was meant to be, and he'd been resisting it all along. This raises, of course, very significant questions about why we resist what we're meant to be. I want to save that for a little while, so keep that churning at the back if you don't mind, for now and for future discussions. All right, so when we first meet him, he is, as we have said, rather stolid, unimaginative, and immobilized. But he has a dog that acts as his agent. And I mean that in the old sense, and, and a provocateur, right? How does the dog provoke him, and what is the nature of their relationship? <laughs> oh, by the way, you want another anachronism? What's the dog's name? Garm. Garm, where's that come from, James? That's from the Norse sagas. That's from Norse sagas, which perhaps date to the 800s and 900s, the mythology could conceivably be older, but Garm in the Norse mythology is the hound of hell. Yeah. <laughs> so he's named for a dog in Norse mythology. An anachronism. What's the relationship? Danielle, what do you recollect about the relationship between Garm and Giles? The dog, yeah. the dog thinks he's amazing, yes. and he's kind of fearful. Yes. Yes. The, the dog has a certain slithery masochistic quality, would it be fair to say, because at one and the same time, he knows that Giles is a bully, he's afraid of Giles, but he also, in the fashion of the masochist, worships him, yes, adores him, even adores the one who torments him as much as Giles does. Now, in fairness to Giles, of course, Maybe Garm periodically gets a whacking with a stick or he gets a bottle thrown at him, but what do we know about Garm in relation to the punishments visited upon him? How severe are they really, Leo, would you say? Apparently not very, and he's learned to dodge thrown bottles, right? <laughs> so the relationship is antagonistic, but on Garm's part, worshipful at the same time. And it must be said, Giles speaks harshly to him. But Garm acts as an agent by warning him and inciting him to action. Garm has a quality that Giles lacks. What is that? Uh -huh. Seems to have fear or paranoia. Yes. And an urge to do something about yes. it. Yes, yeah, that's right. Most especially, he manifests that by wandering the countryside. He's the one who goes abroad, Giles never does. He has his farmhouse, he has his fields, he has his livestock, that's his life. But Garm, Garm likes to wander, he likes to explore. But when he explores, he comes across things.
And the first thing he comes across for the purposes of this narrative is not a dragon at all. What is it? You recall? It's a giant. Yeah, it's a giant whose name is never given, right? It's just a giant, the largest and stupidest of giants, we're told. <laughs> Who is also nearsighted and somewhat deaf. It turns out he's almost completely deaf. So it's the giant that Garm finds. And he comes home and he wakes up his master who throws a bottle at him. And then for the first time ever, we are moved to believe Garm gives him what Tolkien would elsewhere call sauce. We would say sass, right? He sasses him. And this is unprecedented. What is the effect upon Giles? He's never heard the dog do this before. Go ahead, please. It kind of took him away from his anger for a moment. That's right. More startling. Yeah, it woke him up with startlement. This is entirely unusual. Therefore, Garm, who could have sneaked in with the milk, as he says, in the morning and not gotten in trouble for going abroad, instead bothers to wake him up from beneath his window and tell him a fantastic tale. Why? Add the sauce, and what you've got is Garm telling the truth. There's really a giant out there. So the account is credible, and it has to be faced. What else is Giles going to do? Why does he go out? Garm has excited him, but... Is he concerned about his farm or something? Well, yeah, exactly, right? His primary motivation is his concern with trespassers who harm his property. Right? Garm has awakened him. Garm has given him sort of the exciting moment. The Oregonist moment. <coughs> but he's worried now because his cow has been stamped as flat as a doormat, Garm says. <laughs> That's so sad. Oh, poor Galathea. Isn't it horrible? <laughs> I mean, it really is. A very pretty cow. Yes. Yeah, his favorite cow in point. I know. Yeah, it's a lovely drawing by Pauline Banks. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. But there she is, flat as a doormat. Fortunately, Pauline Baines didn't draw that part. And so he's got to do something about it. He just happens to have a blunderbuss. And he loads it and takes it with him. He's never set it off, as far as anybody can remember. He's never fired it. And in fact, one is forced to wonder, does he know whether it'll work at all? Right? So you give it a big charge of gunpowder, and you throw all this junk down its huge bore, and you go out there not knowing whether it's going to shoot or not. But it's his property, so he has no real choice. Would you say it's fortunate that the giant is stupid, nearsighted, and deaf? Is that a fortunate turn of events for Giles, fair to say? <laughs> right? What are the consequences of those three debilities? He's stupid, he's nearsighted, and he's deaf. What are the consequences? Uh, Giles is able to defeat him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, yeah. If, he had, if the giant had any idea what was going on, that he was being shot by a farmer with a blunderbuss, much smaller and weaker than himself, a single shot weapon that would have to be laboriously reloaded, right? He would simply have stood up to his full height, moved out one of his big booted feet, and squished him like Galathea. <laughs> and then we'd have two doormats. <laughs> but that isn't what happens. Instead, he feels like he's been stung by a fly on the nose. And he says, well, it's not very pleasant around here. And off he goes. He runs away. Goes back. And, and anyway, he has another incentive for getting home. Do you remember what it is? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. He forgot his best yes. copper pot yeah, on the he, fire. Yeah, he left his copper pot on the fire. He just flayed the pot, you know, because copper is soft metal. It will melt or burn through. And so, of course, he's concerned about his copper pot. And off he goes home, none the wiser for what has actually happened to him. Or, we must also recognize, the sequence of events he himself has kick-started. Because he goes home and tells his tale. Farmer Giles becomes a local hero. When the giant tells his tale, who eventually hears it? Nah. The dragon. The dragon hears it and decides, well, this is an interesting place to go plunder. Let's go see what's up there. I haven't been out in ages. And of course, the giant's account is not true 
because he has no idea of Farmer Giles, no idea of blunderbusses, no idea of the defense of ham that can be mounted and so on and so forth. Right for the plucking, he thinks, by the giant's narrative. Tell me a little bit, if you would, please, about the characterization of the dragon. Smart. He's smart. Smart in what way? Smart Einstein smart? No, no. he's clever in the way that he can talk. His yes, way yes, he's wily and slithery, a little bit like Garm when you stop and think about it, right? Only at a much profounder level. He is, well... Very rich, cunning, inquisitive, greedy, well-armored. Say again, please. It says, very rich, cunning, inquisitive, greedy, well-armored. Yeah. Those took me Smaug-like characters. Well, exactly right, of course, right. I mean, this is, shall we say, one of Smaug's brothers mm -hmm. from The Hobbit, of course. And he also, of course, as a figure, Given that he is sly, subtle, insinuative, materialistic, and capable of driving bargains he has no intention of keeping, he should be reminiscent of other interesting characters. Go ahead, please. The serpent. Yes, right? He is the subtlest of beasts, is he not? And also in the back. Uh, I was going to say, um, he also has a sense of tradition because he's talking about uh, the, the knight who comes to, uh, when Jowls comes to challenge yes. him. Yes. Talking about how oh yes. Tradition to, uh, introduce yourselves. As as if a dragon had honor, right? All he has is an imperial limit, lineage and a personality that, in fact, is directly traceable to the subtlest of beasts, right? And of course, the subtlest of beasts in the Hebrew account becomes in the Christian account Satan himself. Yes. The Greeks. Yeah. yeah. The giant seven-headed man. Exactly right. Yes. Right. So the dragon is a diabolical figure, but one that's rendered, well, I guess we can say the word now. He's rendered in Chaucerian style, right? He's like the fox, also, in Chaucer's tale of Chanticleer. He is wily, insinuous, he's very good with language, he's persuasive, and of course he's utterly devious. He is without what we would call honor, though he's very ready to invoke honor in others and make them ashamed of behaving dishonor. He's perfectly willing to try that trick on people. You also mentioned, I think, when you were describing some of his other attributes, he's very rich. Chrysophylax dives, right? Which means gold guardian rich, right? So he's gold guardian rich, Chrysophylax dives. And we're also obliged to remember another dives. In fact, there are two. Right? Dives in the New Testament is a rich man who cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? So we have this figure, albeit rendered in comical Chaucerian burlesque, who echoes attributes of a satanic enemy. Only a little tweaking would turn this into a kind of medieval Christian tragedy. But instead, it's comedy. How is it that, like Chaucer, Tolkien feels empowered to make fun of the diabolical? Why would anybody do It's not very funny. Damnation isn't very funny. Satanic manipulation certainly isn't very funny, as, you know, 70 years of horror films will surely have convinced you, among other kinds of narratives. Why does he feel empowered to make fun of the devil who can entrap you in hell for eternity? Wasn't that a rather risky business, James? It could be he's drawing on folkloric ideas of the devil. Yes. Where, especially Irish ones. Yes. Where you make fun of the devil because <laughs> he's a loser. Yes, that's right. If you keep your head about you, what you know about Satan is that he loses, right? He is the enemy of God who is perennially defeated, and therefore he can be turned into a figure of mockery. And you don't, it's wonderful to go to Ireland, you don't have to, because, of course, in the English tradition as well, the stage tradition, the wandering plays, and all that stuff in the Middle Ages, Satan is a comical figure. As late as the late 1500s, we have Marlowe setting off firecrackers in connection 
with the devil's agents, right? A figure in part of comedy, sometimes wry comedy, sometimes burlesque comedy. So Chrysophylax Dives represents the defeat of the satanic in comic terms. The relationship between Giles and the dragon is rather complicated. Can you sort of lay it out for us so that we understand the comic nature of that relationship? Go ahead, please. Yes. Well, the dragon is clearly the more powerful being, yes. but he will bend. Physically powerful. Oh, yeah. And intellectually powerful in some ways. I would agree. Yes. But he will bow to uh, Farmer Giles' will because Farmer Giles has this weapon, this ah. tool that he Where'd that sword come from? The king. Yeah, it was a gift it's from the king. That's correct, yes, right? <laughs> this suggests to us that everything associated with that sword is out of fashion in the Middle Kingdom, right? Because it's been hanging up in the armory, everybody's forgotten what it is, and the king gives it to him because he has no use for it. It's better, it's better off in Giles' hands because it's a token reward, otherwise meaningless as far as the king is concerned. So that would suggest to us in turn that dragon fighting and the particular kinds of enchantments that are associated with dragon fighting in the old, old days, all of these things have dissipated in the Middle Kingdom. When the king hears about the relationship between Chrysophylax and Giles, what is his interest? The glory of the kingdom? We'll have another chapter in our kingdom's history that will go down in the words of the bards as glorious. Is that his interest? Leah? He wants money. <laughs> and so he's very, very eager, not merely to get money, but to get the treasure that Giles himself has earned through courage and luck. He's represented as an expropriative sovereign, therefore on some level illegitimate by the end of the narrative. Tell me more, if you would please, about this relationship between Giles and the dragon. You're right, of course, by luck and the mistake of the king, Giles has the sword that will tame a dragon. But what if it weren't Giles? What if it were the blacksmith or the miller who had come by this sword? Why is it Giles? What does he bring, in other words, to the wielding of the sword and the relationship with the dragon? He has other qualities. Well, I mean, this is going to sound very <clears throat> He like, has like, this clumsy way about him like, where he hit the dragon's wing and yeah. it didn't hurt him at That's all. That's right. But it like, wounded him. But it reduced to him to dependency. Yes, to scare the dragon and make him like, kind That's of right. need him. Yes. So his clumsiness is Yes, so there is a certain wise simpleton quality to the figure of Farmer Giles, right? The wise simpleton is a recurrent figure I'm sure you're familiar with. We'll see it again and again. But this wise simpleton quality is also then associated with his luck. He's been lucky to get the sword. He's been lucky to be able to wield it in a limited sort of way to wound the dragon rather than to kill the dragon. Also, is it true or not that Giles does have a certain chutzpah, that he has a quality of, I won't say exactly sternness, but stubbornness. Do you understand that, please? I, I would almost say it's spiteful. Yes, there's an element of that. Because when the miller and the black That's right. are like, you can't yeah. do it, you can't yeah. do it. Oh, well, watch me do it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there, there's a certain need to prove himself when he has been provoked, especially by the miller, and to a certain extent also by the blacksmith. But here the miller is his particular enemy, right? or at least his antagonist. So he needs to show, he needs to prove, he needs to make the miller wrong. What else? When, go ahead, please, yes. Uh, I was just going to say, I, at the end, uh, I thought it was funny where he, after he became king and whatnot, he put the monopoly on the miller. Oh yes, of course, yes. He's not above a certain 
vindictive retribution, right? To the Miller's harm, but not ultimately to his, his, his death or anything of that sort. So yes, I mean, Tolkien clearly is portraying this hero as a flawed hero. He has drawbacks, but he also has strengths. For example, James. No one drives a bargain. That's right. right. Number one, he cherishes his property protectively, and he doesn't like trespassers. So, okay, I'm going to go after the giant. We'll see what happens. And when it comes to facing down a wily bargainer like Chrysophylax, Farmer Giles is going to outlast him. Nobody, as you said, drives a harder bargain than Farmer Giles of hand. So if the dragon tries his tricks on Giles, nope, Giles knows what to do. And it turns out, in point of fact, that though he's thrust into very dangerous situations, not only is he lucky, he also, when it's all said and done, is stubborn, persistent, and even courageous, right? It also turns out he's actually, well, rather clever in his way. So all of these attributes, which at first were sublimated in a character solid, immobilized, unimaginative, and unadventurous, one by one, begin an efflorescence that will turn him into a hero and a king. How exactly does that transpire? It's dangerous business consorting with dragons, is it not? Very dangerous indeed. Can you describe for me his companion knights on their visit to Chrysophylax after Chrysophylax has broken his word and not brought the treasure as he promised? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the behavior of the king's knights. What do you recollect about them? Yes, please. Well, they didn't want him to come along. Yeah. Really. Then he had ended up leading the whole thing. They don't really know yeah. how to behave. Yeah. Like they're singing and sure. they're talking really loud and distracting everything. Yeah. The very end. Yes, they're inept. That's what it comes to. These are people who have become knights in a context where virtually nothing but, I suppose one might say, the stereotype of aristocratic indifference is required of them. Yes? So they're inept. And also, Tolkien has a beef with people who don't really believe in dragons. You may remember this, right? He has a beef with such people. And what he does is characterize them as persons who have forgotten their heritage. And they have forgotten it to their peril. Dragons do exist, as a matter of fact. And if you simply dismiss them as myths, you go riding right into their dens and into an ambush where most of you get killed because you are so stupid as to have forgotten your own legends and myths. <laughs> And that leaves only Giles standing, ultima ombre, right? <laughs> Last man on the field. What do you suppose Tolkien has set out to do here? Certainly to entertain us always. Certainly to entertain us with a type of tale that he himself finds charming and enjoyable. But is there more to it? A farmer, by virtue of luck and courage, becomes a king with the aid of a dragon he has tamed and made his servant. What's he telling us? What kind of a story is that? In the crudest terms, go ahead, yeah. Story. In, in a way it is, isn't it, right? It's the transformation of the ash maiden into the princess. It's the story of a rise through a word that Tolkien himself uses, merit. This is not about aristocratic birth. This makes fun of aristocratic birth, right? What is the king able to do? It can't be said in the end that he's a coward. He isn't, right? But he is greedy. He is, for all his lineage, actually rather unsophisticated and forgetful. And he relies too much on his own status 
as his authority. Giles, by the end of the story, has authority that he's earned through luck and merit. And notice Tolkien's very careful to say that while he's king, he advances people in his little kingdom according to merit. A direct slap to advancement by mere birth. So it's a story, I was going to say in the crudest terms, it's a story of upward mobility. And that brings it then fully forward, tongue in cheek, into the bourgeois era, where people make themselves by dint of luck and hard work. Also, I trust you will have noticed, this will be, have to be our final remark on the subject, you will have noticed that Tolkien sets out to have some word fun in addition to the names, right? So that, in point of fact, he names certain locales. There actually is a river tame that runs into the Thames. It's about 65 miles long, and it runs right through the heart of what Tolkien imagines was the Little Kingdom. There actually is a town, <coughs> a village, whose name is still officially Worming Hall, and they do actually locally pronounce it Wernal. Because he says villages have lost their pride. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there for now and go on with our next set. Thanks, everybody.